mountains You can move all of those big waves in your ocean I'm the lighthouse to bring you home I'm the maker of the atlas I navigate all the roads You can follow my footsteps Follow me Sitting in a park car, dark outside Overthinking everything inside my mind I'm out of my head and I'm out of my soul I know I gotta take a break and gotta let it go Little did you know that you're the reason I'm alive All those stupid conversations up on FaceTime Too late when I was in low And you didn't even know you were keeping me alive Guys, something about you really feels like home Something about you really feels so safe So 
you know that you're the reason I'm alive All those stupid conversations up on FaceTime Too late when I was in low And you didn't even know you were keeping me alive Guys, something about you really feels like home Something about you really feels so safe You wonder if you got it, wonder if you got it in you Some days looking for the reason why Feels like standing on a runway, standing out on a runway lately Watching everybody else fly by See the finish line One shot, are you gonna take it? Are you gonna take it this time? One life, don't let it pass you by
It's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I hope you are excited to be here to worship our Lord and Savior. I'm excited that you're able to be here with us, and uh, we are so thankful to be able to come into the house of the Lord. Wasn't last Sunday's Easter services just exceptional? So uh, we, we had an attendance record last week, at least as far back as I could find any specific Sunday records. We had 369 last week, and that is uh, super exciting, and uh, we're just glad to, glad to see what God can do, and uh, we are so thankful for that. Well, let's pray and invite the Lord to bless this service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come into this space, and you are our God, and we are your people. And we are thankful for your presence in our life. We're thankful for the grace you give us. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for the relationship that we can have with you. And Heavenly Father, as we sing the songs and we we give the offering and, and we participate in all the aspects of the service, we just pray that your name is glorified and that you'll bless your people today. We ask you to receive everything we do and say as an offering of praise from a thankful people. And we are truly thankful for who you are. In Jesus' precious name we pray this. Amen. If you're a guest with us, we want to say a special welcome. We're super glad that you're able to join us today. There's a little card in the seat back in front of you. If you want to fill that out and take it to the information desk after the service, we have a little gift that we'd like to give you, uh, a little travel mug just as a thank you for joining us, and we're really glad that you're here. And with that, let's worship our Lord. Well, welcome, church. Y'all stand and worship with us this morning. Father, 
introduced that song last week, and uh, y'all y'all seem to uh, seem to go along with it. So I thought we'd do it again this week, just to get it more in our heads. But I love the words of that song, and uh, just uh, glorifies God's name. today. Amen. Y'all give give the Lord a hand. Amen. Jesus. 
this time our ushers will come forward and we will receive the Lord's tithes and our offerings. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives and in this service. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all the incredible blessings that you pour into our lives. You are truly good. 
And we know that everything that we have that's good in our life comes from you. And we're thankful, Lord God, that we have the opportunity to participate in building your kingdom by giving back a portion of the blessings you've given to us to your work. And so we pray, Lord, you'll take these funds and use them to build your kingdom. We pray, Lord God, that those who are living without hope, without life, without knowing you, will come to know you and the freedom that they have in Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of their sins because of the generosity of your people. And we pray all of this in the wonderful name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
come to our time of prayer today. Uh, there are, of course, uh, many prayer requests in our congregation. We want to continue to remember Sylvia as she's on the road to recovery, and Ernie Cole as well, as he's recovering from successful surgery. And, uh, of course, we want to remember little baby Dalton. And I got my Dalton Strong wristband. I don't know if you know about these. These are a thing. And uh, if you uh, uh, go to either Elizabeth or Rachel's Facebook page, there's a link to where you can get one. And if you don't know how to go to Elizabeth or Rachel's Facebook page, you can find me or my wife, Andrea. Raise your hand, Andrea. And, and we'll show you how to do it. And a friend of the family has made these bracelets. And uh, you can buy one. And then all the funds go to the family. And they've got a really long road ahead of them. Um, Dalton, uh, he's, he's got an official diagnosis. It's called neuroblastoma. And they have a treatment plan, and he's going to be undergoing some significant uh, chemotherapy uh, in, the, in the days ahead. And uh, a long road of recovery, but we know that God has been at work, and God will continue to be at work. And one of the most powerful things about the bracelets, in addition to showing support for the family, it's a tangible reminder as you're going through your day to stop and pray for pray for Dalton. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to have. So we encourage you. Now, some of you may be thinking, yeah, but I don't like UT. You know, some of you people are kind of weird and you're into like Alabama or Georgia or whatever. This is an excellent opportunity to show that you love Dalton more than you hate UT. And now you can't not get one, right? Well, I'd invite you if you'd like to come to the altar and pray. It is a space that God has given us, a place where we can come, where we can bring the concerns that we have, the things in our lives. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't have to be a hardship or a suffering that you're going through. You can also come to the altar and just say, Lord, I'm thankful for who you are. I'm thankful for the grace you give me. I thank you for the salvation. Uh, whatever you'd like to bring to the Lord, we invite you to come to the altar at this time as we go in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne, Lord, and you are exalted. 
and Most High. You are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You are the one who created us, who sustains us, who holds us and keeps us, Lord God. We are your people. We are the sheep of your flock. And we are so thankful, Lord God, that you are our God. We come into this space, Lord God, and we have a number of people going through various life circumstances. And you are the Lord of all of them. You are God on the throne. You, Lord God, know what we need better than we know our own selves. And so, Lord, we come into this space and we bring our requests to you and we bring uh, our needs before you, Lord God, and we come with confidence and boldness and assurance that you receive us and we lay them at your feet and we say, Lord God, your will be done in our lives as it is in heaven. And we know that you are working for our good. You have promised that in your word and we believe it to be true. And so, Lord God, we trust you and we believe that you will give us what we need, when we need it, and how we need it. And Lord God, we just are so glad that we don't have to walk through this life alone, that we've got a church family that supports us, encourages us, and lifts us up. As we're going through difficult seasons, we have people to come alongside us and be more than friends, Lord, be brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we're so thankful for this community that you've built this community that you've built that we're a part of. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful, Lord God, that you are with us every step of the way of the journey of life, that we will never be alone, whether we are walking through seasons of joy or seasons of heartache, Lord, we know that you are with us, ordering our steps, making the path straight, and guiding us and leading us to your perfect will for our lives. Lord God, you are truly wonderful. We pray today especially for Sylvia as she is continuing to recover in, in the rehab, Lord God. And we just pray that she can get the knee and no infection and get well and get back to life, Lord God. She's had a very hard journey. And we just ask for a special grace for her to help her to be well. We thank you, Lord, for the successful surgery for our brother Ernie. And we just pray that he has a rapid recovery. And, uh, Lord, that he can get back to, to all the things he loves doing tend in his yard and all the things that he loves to do. And we pray especially this morning for baby Dalton, Lord God. We just ask as he goes through this chemo that, that his body receives it well, that the, that the medicine destroys the cancer and does not harm his healthy cells. We pray, Lord God, for miraculous intervention on this child's behalf. And we know, Lord God, that you're able to do so much more than we can hope. You can do so much more than we can think. You can, be, you can do so much more than we can even imagine. And so we place this child in your hands with a confident knowledge that you are the God of life and hope and joy. And Heavenly Father, we pray all of this in the wonderful and the holy and the matchless name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all the people of God said, Amen. When I get nervous, I kind of get silly. Um, and I am nervous this morning. I usually don't get nervous. Um, the Lord's been dealing with me the last couple of months, asking me to do something that I really didn't want to do. Uh, he's asked me to tell my story, and, and I do have a story. And I met with Pastor Kevin and said, should I really do this? Is it even appropriate? And he said, the Lord's asking you to do it, then you need to do it. So this is a, an act of obedience, I guess. I, I'm really just a sinner saved by grace. Um, it, it's interesting that I felt led to do it on this particular day, like two months ago. And pretty soon you'll see why it was this day. Uh, grew up here in Gallatin, born and raised. Had a really good childhood. Everything was was wonderful, went to church, learned all the Bible stories because that's what you did a long time ago in Gallatin. In fact, if you didn't go to church, you were kind of a weirdo. But when I turned 16 and got the driver's license and 
the lure of driving a car kind of lured me away from church, and I didn't go for several years. Um, graduated high school at GHS, Go Green Wave. Um, and that summer, uh, my mother was diagnosed with cancer, a brain tumor. And that kind of set me back, you know. Um, but I still, I, I went away to college and came home on the weekends when I could. And I met a young lady and uh, started dating her. And she's sitting back there today. <laughs> and uh, started going to church with her. Not really because I wanted to go to church. I just wanted to be with her. <laughs> and it was this church. But in coming with her and with what I was going through, the Lord really started to deal with me. And every time I came home from school, I would come to church with her. On Easter Sunday, 1981, my mother passed away. And something that was awful for anybody to lose your mother, God used it. See, I'd been under conviction coming to church here and felt like I really needed to get back to the Lord, but I, I really didn't know how. But on Easter Sunday morning, when you're celebrating the risen Lord, it just clicked in my head and in my heart that, you know, my mother's alive too. She's risen too. She's with the Lord. And I decided right then that next Sunday, I was going to come to the altar. That's kind of what you did back then, right here on the right in the old sanctuary, and give my life to the Lord. So you see, my spiritual birthday is the Sunday after Easter, this Sunday. And um, from that point on, you know, I now looking back, you know, they say hindsight's twenty twenty, but it's way better than that. <laughs> looking back, I see that the Lord's been with me through thick and through thin. And like most people, there's, there's been a lot of thin. Um, uh, I married my beautiful bride back there in June of 1984, and I guess y'all can do some math, <laughs> but uh, we're going to celebrate 40 years this year. Best thing that ever happened to me, uh, she's meant so much to me. She's a strong believer, and I've learned a lot from her, but our life's journey was just beginning. Less than a year after that, I tragically lost my brother and my father. Um, it was even too hard, too painful to talk about it. In fact, I didn't talk about it, didn't want to talk about it. Um, but even through all that, I was so glad I was a Christian because the church was there for me. And they ministered to me. I basically was an orphan. I, I didn't really have any family at that point. They adopted me. And so I got through that. Things were going well. Um, around Easter, well, probably wasn't Easter, in 1989, Tammy was diagnosed with cancer. And so that's, you know, a blow that, you know, you start thinking all these things, you know. Is God punishing us? What have we done wrong? Um, I don't want to lose her. Well, she, she went through treatment. She did very well. I mean, she was very young to have breast cancer at 26. I mean, the doctors couldn't even believe it. It was so young. But she went through chemo and radiation, and, and they told us, you know, she's probably going to be okay, but you probably will never have children. We didn't like hearing that, but we, we accepted that. And I was so glad that, that she had come through okay. Well, shortly after that, we found out that... Uh, we were pregnant. Um, well, doctors don't always know what they're talking about. <laughs> and um, in September of 91, uh, Lauren was born. Didn't exactly go the way we planned. Um, she was very sick from the beginning, rushed to the NICU in Nashville, in the hospital, in the NICU, in and out of intensive care for months, weeks. Uh, but it was obvious she was going to have severe disabilities. Again, at that point in my time, I wonder, why are we being punished? It feels like 
we're being punished. Have we done something wrong? Is, is God displeased with us? Again, the church stepped up and they, they ministered to us in, in so many ways, uh, wrapped their arms around us, and even though we were sad and crushed and heartbroken, um, God, through the church members, were always there. And um, as Lauren continued to grow and, and all the struggles we've gone through with her, um, we accepted it and we made the best of it. Um, then around Easter, in um, right around 2000, Lauren was diagnosed with leukemia. And so we're like, what else can happen? And why her? She's already suffered so much. And through nearly two years of radiation, chemo, uh, surgeries, um, she really suffered. And I remember one time uh, our doctor was with us and said that the angels aren't circling, circling the bed, but they're in the room. And we, we were thinking we might lose her, but miraculously she's sitting back there this morning even after the doctors told us she's got between six months and 24 months at most to live and that was mm, 23 years ago <laughs> um, I say all that to say that in looking back God's always been there um, and I couldn't see it at the time and I was wondering if there was you know, something we'd done was God displeased with us. But actually now I can see that God was always there. He always loved us. Uh, he worked miracles that we didn't see, couldn't appreciate. And that's kind of brought me to, to where I am today. And I, I'm trying to do the Reader's Digest version and not the War and Peace version. But um, I just felt led to get up here today which is my spiritual birthday. I came to know the Lord the Sunday after Easter, and I didn't really want to do this. And I, I told Kevin, I, you know, I just, I don't want to make it about me. I want to make it about the Lord. And, and it is about the Lord. And even though I think in all those tough times, I wondered if I was being punished, but now I can see, looking back with better than 2020 vision, that the Lord had a plan and he was teaching me and molding me and molding us and using Lauren and blessing us with Lauren and I now look back at those tough times and I now see what the Lord was teaching me and helping me to understand his, his work and his ways and you know I'm just eternally grateful he's always been there he's never let me down even though it, times I thought he did he didn't and as I grow older he's been more real more near to me um, I so appreciate the way that and have learned the way he ministers to us is through people like you guys and through others that have touched us over the years and so I'm just a sinner saved by grace but I just wanted to give him the glory this morning and I wanted to be obedient and stand up here and do this, even though I didn't really want to. But that's what I felt led to do, and I just felt like that's, that's what I should do. And I actually want to thank all of y'all for being there for us and with us through all our journeys. It's meant more than you ever know. And um, Tammy and I and Lauren and oh, I forgot to mention Ethan. We did have a... <laughs> How could you forget him? We did have a... A son that's now 19 years old, and he's full of life, and he's, he's a challenge. So maybe <laughs> I didn't realize what I was asking for, but <laughs> got it anyway. But I want to thank you all very much. I, I want to praise the Lord this morning, and uh, I hope in some ways this might have helped you uh, because you guys have helped me so much. Thank you.
When Reese asked me if he could do that, I said, well, of course. There's almost nothing more powerful than the narrative of someone's journey with God, right? I can come up here and I can, I can tell you, you know, great things. But when you hear it applied from somebody's life lived, there's something powerful in that. And maybe some of you are thinking to yourself, huh, the Lord wants me to do that too. But boy, I sure don't want to. Let me know. We'll make it happen. Right? And if you're like, I cannot possibly stand up in front of a crowd of people and give my testimony, we'll be happy to record it for you and put it on the screen so you don't have to stand here and do that. <laughs> we'll even make it easy for you. But uh, I want to thank you, Reese, for your obedience. Uh, I almost feel like there's really there's not much more needs to be said today. That was great. I am going to preach my sermon a little bit. I'm going to cut it short because it's, uh, you know, it's it's... I mean, that was, that was everything right there. So we thank you so much for that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the theology of rest. And uh, the reason I want to do this is, oh, I'm sorry, Homer, I didn't see you back there, brother. You want to say something? Yeah. Can you come forward and use a microphone? Because folks won't be able to hear you online if you don't. I can bring you a microphone. Everybody wants to hear you, and we might not be able to hear you if we don't have a microphone. There you go, brother. Well, a lot of people here know me, and a lot of people that don't know me. And I says, I've got, that's my seat right here. I was sitting there, been sick, couldn't get healed, couldn't get nothing done till the Lord turned, set the angel. I think it was an angel. And I bear words in my ear. You need, son, you need to go to the altar. Well, I was about half hard headed and I didn't pay much attention to it. The next Sunday, that same voice came. And I said, I guess I better go because it might be a third time. <laughs> so I've, uh, on my left, on my surgery, this guy said, told me who to go to to see. And he didn't said he didn't do that kind of stuff, but he would recommend one. So he did. That's eleven years ago that I had that surgery. And he that is the doctor when he I was laying there on the table waiting for him to come in and talk to him and he come in there and he says, son said, I always have to tell the people that I'm fixing to do this surgery. Said it takes three to five hours to do it. And he said, you could not ever get up from here off this table. I said, that'd be fine, doc. He said, what do you mean it'll be fine? I said, because I'm going to be in a heck of a better place than you are. <laughs> and so I went on to the surgery, got out in three hours, and it's been 11 years. And I'm still sitting in that chair. <laughs> and the Lord had been great to me and my family, and I'm proud to be a member here of this church, and proud for the preacher. Some people might, might not like him, but I <laughs> <do>. <laughs> I, li I, I like him, and uh, if you uh, if you don't put 
God, number one in your house. Amen. You're missing something. Yep. Because we are number one people, my wife and I. Amen. For 60, going on 60 something years. I'm, I'm fixing to turn 86, so I've been around this town. You've been I, around, brother. I knew Lee Reese when he was a kid. Yeah. Amen. His mother was a great friend of mine. She was a, worked for the welfare. And she told me one day, she said, I'm going to get you the, some welfare money. And $15 a month that I got. And that really pushed Reese in front and that with me to know that he remembers, he probably, he remembers me, I know, because I knew him and his dad both. And I just want to thank this church. And a good friend of mine told me, he says, anytime you in a crowd of big people, a bunch of them, Somebody needs you, son. He said, you need to give your testimony. Because I know there's some people in here that I don't know me. And there's a lot of people in here that I know. And uh, I just want to thank the Lord every day. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. So we're going to we're going to hit this topic of rest and I'm going to do it really fast. That kind of sounds oxymoronic, doesn't it? Right. It's, it's a little backwards. But uh, I, I do want us just to talk about this. We're going to do three weeks on the topic, so I may, I may just snip out a little bit and do it later. But, but rest is an important idea. It's an important concept. And the way this got into my brain was in the Church of the Nazarene. I'm in my seventh year here at Gallatin. In the Church of the Nazarene in the manual, uh, it stipulates that, that pastors should receive a, a sabbatical in their seventh year. Um, and so the board has voted for me to take a sabbatical this year. Uh, and so this summer, I'll be gone for a few weeks as I, as I participate in a sabbatical. Uh, a time, it's, it's designed for rest and renewal. Um, and, uh, and I'm very, 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 very thankful for it. Um, Barna did a study. Uh, they do a study every year. And, they, and it's not just in America. It's all over the world. And, and they basically gauge people's stress and happiness levels all around the world. Uh, and and what, what's really fascinating, from the time they began doing the study until now, every single year, people are less happy and more stressed out than the year before. It's, it's fascinating. It's, it's just this, you, they chart the graphs on these, these quotients of happiness and these quotients of stress, and just every single year, it, it's, it's a little worse than the year before. It probably isn't a huge surprise that the actual unhappiest place in the world is Afghanistan, um, when, when you live in a country that's been through war for decades and decades and decades, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but even in, in America, there's, there's, there's all-time high levels of stress. Uh, and, and stress, you know, can do all kinds of just terrible things to you. I mean, it can, it can just throw you for a total loop. Um, and one of the things I want us to know is that God wants us to be well. God doesn't want us to live with a lot of stress and anxiety and, and hardship and things like that. And so we as Christians need to have a rhythm of life that has some opportunities to take some rest. It's an important idea. And it does, this is not a new concept. You know, it's, it's not a, a brand new notion. It goes all the way back to the time of Moses, right? If you go to Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 10, it says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. 
And it's interesting because what we've kind of made Sabbath into isn't exactly what Sabbath was designed to be. So we see that word to remember and make it holy, and what we think that means is, so go to church. Now, I'm a pastor of a church, and I'm a big fan of people going to church. I think it's great. But holy, to be holy, is to be set apart. And so what the Lord is actually saying here isn't this is a day for worship. He's saying it's a day that should be different than all the rest of your days. You have all these days, and I want you to have one day that's set apart. And Yeah, it's totally appropriate to engage in worship on this day. I think it's wonderful. But if you really look at what he says here, he says you have six days to work, so on this day, take a break. Take a rest. You need to have a rest. And so the point of Sabbath is rest. Now, it's become a lot of thing over the years. In Jesus' day, it became this really strict law with all these rules about how many steps you can take and all these different things and what kind of things you can do and other things you can't do. But those aren't the things that make it Sabbath. What makes it Sabbath is rest. And so here's some things we need to look at. Americans are not good at resting. Like, kind of in the American culture, one of the worst things that you can be called is lazy. Right? I mean, what an insult to be called lazy. That's, that, I mean, that just kind of hurts if somebody were to say that about you. And, and so we as a culture are pretty bad at being able to pause and rest. Because for a lot of us, when we pause and we rest, there may be a little nagging voice. You should be doing a little more. What's wrong with you? Are you lazy? How are you going to accomplish your goals? What about that cabinet you wanted to clean out? What about that thing you needed to get done? Right? And so it can be very challenging to rest. And so we go on vacation. And sometimes we do vacation so unrestfully. You know, it's the joke, right? When you're coming back from vacation, you're like, ooh, that was a lot of fun, but I need a vacation from my vacation. Right? We, we don't understand as Americans all the time that there is a distinct difference between amusement and rest. Now, should we have vacations that are fun and amusing? Absolutely. That's great. But we need to make sure that in our lives, we also are in, building in time for rest. So, so Andrea and I, we kind of have this practice where, where we go on the fun vacations and we do the fun things. And it's, we go and we, you know, I don't know, go scuba diving or we go to Universal Studios or we, you know, go do things. But then we also always try to have a little, little getaway, a little break. And what Andrea and I tend to do on these vacations is not a blessed thing. The objective is to sit, maybe read a good book, maybe look at the beach, not even necessarily go swimming at the beach, just looking at it and feeling the breezes and just doing not a blessed thing and having that time to recharge our batteries. And, and another thing that we often fail to understand is that there is a difference between productivity and busyness. You can be super busy and not get hardly anything done. And you can also have times where you, where you work in little bursts and you get so much done. There's a difference between amusement and rest, and there's a difference between productivity and busyness. And so one of the things is we have to learn to have a way to understand that we can rest, and resting properly, because God designed us to people who take a rest, when we rest properly, it actually makes us more productive. We can actually get a lot more done. There's a couch in my office. About two in the afternoon, if you come to the office, there is a relatively decent chance that you might find me snoring on my couch. There's nothing quite as powerful as like a 15-minute nap after eating lunch. And I can promise you, this is a weird thing, but I'm almost certain that from like 2.30 till the end of the day, I'll get more done than I got done in all the rest of the day put together. There's just something about the little break to take a moment and stop and rest. And so our lives are the same way. We have this life where we're busy and we're going, we're busy and we're going, we're doing it, we're doing it, we're busy and we're going, we're doing Yeah, I said do-do. We do-do-do-do-do all the time. I'm glad someone laughed at that. 
And we go 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 and we go. And if we stop, we feel bad about it. But I want us to hear it's a biblical mandate that God wants us to stop. And not only not feel about it, but, but celebrate it and rejoice in it and enjoy it. God made us to take a break. And so here's, 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 the, here's the basic point of it all. Is if you find yourself a person who doesn't know how to rest. Or who feels guilty about taking times of rest. Or, or thinks that like if you take an entire day and do nothing, that, that's like a terrible thing to do. I want you to know that, that, that you can understand rest as well. And the way you do it is you turn to Christ. If, I mean, that's always the answer every week, isn't it? Sometimes I'm amazed that y'all come back week after week because this answer is always exactly the same thing. Turn to Jesus. Jesus can fix it. Jesus can take care of it. Jesus has it, right? So there's a Bible verse that I think is really, really great. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says this. Come to me, all you who are wearied and burdened, and I will give you rest. When you're kind of stressed out and you're at your wit's end and you're at the end of your rope and you're, and you're burned out, you're frazzled, turn to Jesus. Come to me, all you who are wearied and burdened, and I will give you rest. Rest is a gift from God. It's a gift that he wants us to live into. Christ sets us free from cultural expectations of what, how hard you're supposed to work. Now, I'm not advocating being slothful. That's going in the opposite direction. I think it's good for us to be productive and get stuff done. But Christ gives us the freedom from what other people might describe about how you should or shouldn't engage in your work. We're all wired differently. Some of us need a little bit more. Some of us need a little less. But we all need some rest. So we're freed from that. And Christ alleviates guilt. Jesus takes away guilt, but not just guilt from sin, also self-imposed guilt that we put on ourselves because we're not meeting whatever expectation we think ought to be met. Christ sets us free from that guilt. It is a gift from God, but like every gift that Christ gives us, whether it's the forgiveness of sins or rest, whatever the gifts that God gives us, we still have to receive the gift that he gives us. We still have to be willing to accept it and take it. I'm not going to lie. There's a little part of me that is dealing with some guilt about taking a sabbatical. Like, well, I mean, it's a little egotistical to think the whole church is going to fall apart because I take a few weeks off, right? That's, that's, that's sort of the height of arrogance. But it is hard to, to turn it off. One of the things about being a pastor is that as a pastor, you're never not a pastor, right? Right? It doesn't matter if you're in the office or if it's 11 p.m. or whatever. If you're a pastor, you're always a pastor. Uh, and it's this weird conflation of like career and calling and religion and faith. And it's kind of just a weird thing in a lot of ways, being a pastor, honestly. And, but it, but it's, it's a little bit telling. So one of the things I've been working through with this idea is saying, okay, Lord, the church has spoken that this is a thing that should happen. The board has decided. So I need to receive this rest that you give me. And I, I feel like I'll probably come back pretty energized from the whole thing. But where are you? Are you weary? Are you tired? Are you stressed out? If Barna were to pull you today, where would you fall on their, their list? Would you be contributing to the, yeah, we're super stressed out and unhappy? We'd be like, no, life is... Where are you? Do you find it hard to rest when there's so much to do? Here's a simple fact. There'll always be more to do. And I think what made it possible for me to take the sabbatical and, and not feel guilty about it is I kind of did realize that, that it's God's church. And that's true for your life, too. You know there'll always more to do? There'll always be more to do. If there's always more to do, you don't have to get it all done. Because as soon as you get it done, there's more to do. As soon as you get that done, there's more to do. If there's always more to do, you don't have to do it all. Because you can't. So take the rest. Are you, taking, are you willing to choose to let Christ give you rest? Are you willing to trust? I would encourage you to say yes to that. So next week, I'm not going to be here. I normally don't announce when I'm not coming. 
because uh, that's just, you know, bad pastoring 101. Uh, and y'all going to be, you got a treat next week because a better preacher than me's coming. His name's Sean Stevenson. And so Pastor Sean, our children's pastor, is going to be preaching next week, and it's going to be great. And there might, I don't know, I don't know, I, I don't know what he's doing because he hasn't told me, but I mean, he might do a magic trick. You never know. He is a children's pastor. Um, but he's great. But the district is sending me to Montana to go fly fishing. I'm real excited about that. I've never been fly fishing, I've never been to Montana. And, and, and this is sort of like a, a, a beginning of the, the season of rest for me that I'm going through. And it's not easy, but I'm going to do it. And I'm going to encourage you. Take the rest that God... When God opens the door for you to take a rest, take it. Say yes. Take that moment. Whether it's 10 minutes on a Tuesday, 15 minutes at 2 in the afternoon, or just literally sitting and doing nothing all Saturday. And to be clear... You can do stuff while resting, because there's stuff that you can do that energizes you, right? If you get energized by digging in the garden, and that's restful for you, go dig in the garden, right? Just take the time. Take the rest. Take it as a gift from God. And know that God is giving it to you, and God wants you to have it. Stay with me, if you will, as we close the service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your movement in our life. Lord God, we live in a culture that demands productivity. And for a lot of us, it defines self-worth. And Lord, I just pray that we can begin to understand that our self-worth is in you and not in what we do. That, that you don't expect any of us to be successful. You just want us all to be faithful. And part of that faithfulness is taking the rest that you give to us. Help us, Lord, to learn how to recognize those moments when you're giving us space for rest. Help us, Lord God, to take the opportunities to rest in who you are and the fact that from the perspective of eternity, the work is completed not dependent on us. It's all on you. And so, Heavenly Father, help us to turn to you, to receive the gifts that you give us, and to go and live into your kingdom and your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you don't have to. I'm gonna. A Sunday afternoon nap might be calling your name. (laughs) I encourage you to do whatever it is God lays on your heart for rest. And I want to say a special thank you to Reese and Homer for sharing their testimonies with us today. It was a true blessing. May you go in the grace and the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Know that your God is with you. Know that your God loves you. And be with Christ. You are dismissed. Now I live to glorify your name